Greetings, I'm Matul Singh. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Fair Observer. Our motto is make sense of the world. Let's try to make sense of economics today. Now, before I carry any good storyteller, I have to begin with a story. And so let's go back two years ago, and I was in the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And um, yes, they let me in sometimes. It was a mistake. Look at me. Clearly the wrong color of tie and no jacket, but they still let me in. Uh, but more interestingly and importantly, and this is the key, is here I am. The wine is flowing. You have some delicacies uh, going around. And I'm uh, with a bunch of old men who are 20 to 30 years older than me. And uh, we start talking. And it transpires that a gentleman to my left is George Akerlof. George won the Nobel Prize in economics. And, and we start chatting about the dire state of the world economy post the 2008 crisis and yada yada and human nature. And uh, at some point I say, George, I have a problem with economics. And the problem is that it makes the assumption that we are profoundly rational. Now, if that were so, amount of time with you, and uh, I would try my best to suss out all your wisdom and uh, download it into my brain so that I can sound clever if not be clever. And uh, I am trying to do that. But if that pretty CCTV correspondent standing on the other side of the room were to walk over, I can assure you, you would not have my undivided attention. Well, he smiled gently and said, well, neither would you. And the point I'm making is, that evolution did not design us to be rational. And that brings me on to the three points I'm going to take up in the course of my talk here. First, I'm going to talk about the assumptions of economics and prove to you that it is not exactly a science. Second, I'm going to take up the history of economics and demonstrate to you that it is profoundly European in its roots and even more Judeo-Christian in its outlook. And finally, I'm going to talk about the reality of the world economic situation and try and explain to you how there are more things in heaven and earth than economic theory to steal a little bit of what Hamlet had to say, good old William Shakespeare, Lord bless his soul. So, point one. The fundamental point. What is a science? Well, in science what you do is you, you try to have a theory. And how do you get there? Well, you start with a hypothesis. You take that hypothesis and you test it. And if the evidence does not hold, well, it fails. And if, if the evidence holds, it's a theory. Until a better theory replaces it. Fantastic. Très bien. Now, problem is, in economics, you are Starting off with an assumption that man is rational. Well, we know that's not true. Second, you are having to test evidence. But human beings are complicated creatures. They are hard to measure. How do you quantify the unquantifiable? How do you arbitrarily assign numbers and values? Let's take a very simple example. I was born in Vasco, and, and my mother put in a hell of a lot of time and energy in making sure that I learned how to read and write and speak. And none of that work that my mother put in will show up in GDP figures. And so there's a huge section of the world uh, that is just missing, and the activities of the world, and, 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 and the profound questions in the world that just don't show up in economics. And instead of theories, you have models, like the solo model or whatever model. And, and they try to come up with neat mathematical formulae to sum up human activity and human economic activity. Now, the problem is they're such crude approximations of reality that they are skinnier than the emaciated models you find in Milan. Now, those of you who've read physics, or actually those of you who've read psychology, will find that Freud talks about penis envy. Now, you may or may not believe or accept his argument, but the interesting thing is, I believe economists uh, suffer from physics envy. Because really, if you were all that clever, you'd, do, you'd be doing physics. Because a lazy physicist's math is what the economist tends doing, ends up doing. <laughs> but 
The desire to prove themselves as as muscular, as rigorous as the physicists makes them quantify, and that leads to intellectual dishonesty quite often. So, economics is on shaky ground there. Let's move on to the history of economics. And the history of economics is fascinating. So one of the first theories that crops up in economics, which lives in various guises today, is mercantilism. Now, what is mercantilism? The wealth of a country is equal to the gold and silver. That's all very fine, but this is the time when nation states are forming, and the state is basically a centralized despot. And the Spaniards and the Portuguese are just looting the wealth. They are just looting gold and silver from Latin America, from everywhere else. It is God and gold. And what is fascinating is that this theory very conveniently justifies and perpetuates a particular form of action. And in his inimitable French way, Louis XIV or Louis XIV says, L'État, c'est moi, the state. That's me, I am the state. And so mercantilism is basically about the monarch becoming more powerful and the monarch being equated with the state. And of course, if the state is more powerful, you'll have more armies and therefore US citizens will reflect in vast glory and you look at Versailles and you can look at it from the outside and admire it. Of course, a revolution happens later, but that's another story. And mind you, all this is fundamentally a Catholic top-down uh, story. Now, it gets interesting. You get Protestantism, and Weber comes up with this idea that it was Protestantism that led to capitalism. And Adam Smith, who's living in Protestant Scotland, actually Presbyterian Scotland, which is a derivative of Calvinism, which began in Geneva, comes up with this idea that, hang on a moment, the wealth of a country is not gold and silver in it. It is the productive capacity of its people. So it's the baker and the butcher and yada yada, they work in and it's the quality of their work that produces wealth. And he says, hang on a moment, trade is not bad. Trade can be actually good for everyone. It's a win-win. It's not a zero-sum game. Let's say we make wool in Scotland, and we can send wool to India, and we can get uh, cotton or silk from India, and both India and uh, Scotland are better off. He didn't give the Indian example. I'm making it up. But you get the point. Trade is a win-win. And he says that man, has a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. He makes an assumption about human nature, and he's coming from a trading seafaring port town. He is a professor of moral philosophy. So it's fascinating that now the idea has moved, and of course, it has been shaped by the economic interests of, of his time, and, and fast forward a few decades later, actually, more than decades, century or so, you have this uh, fellow, um, called uh, Karl Marx, uh, much beloved in many circles even today. And Karl Marx and Engels um, uh, who are two bourgeois gentlemen. They are not members of the working class. They are not proletariat. And they say, wait a minute, excessive competition is going to lead to concentration of wealth, scale, uh, wages will drop down, and therefore there'll be overproduction, and the economy will go belly up. And actually what we need it's a different system. And they are very scientific in their analysis of the problems in the economy, but they become German romantics, classic German romantics, dreaming of a pre-Judeo-Christian era. And Engels goes on to quote Aeschylus and takes the example of Orestia, which is a Greek play. Uh, and Aeschylus is the Greek playwright. And he ends his book by saying that we want to recreate the liberty, equality, and fraternity of the ancient gents. Well, that's all very good. Uh, but again, um, the, the prescription of Soviet councils, etc., is so unwieldy and so European, created in the misery of the in initial Industrial Revolution. Anyone who's read Charles Dickens knows that how rivers were black, how there was soot hanging over London, quite like much of India today, quite like what you're seeing in Kanpur, for instance. The Ganga or the Ganges is black. So this is a time when they are reacting against it, and they are reacting against squalid conditions in urban areas. And so you get this reaction, a very European framework, fantastical. Now, all this theory forgets that the Indians and the Chinese had been trading for a while, and for most of human history, as late as 1820, China had a third of the world GDP, and, and India had a quarter, and pff, uh, none of the experiences of Latin America, Africa, China, India, were, are ever 
in economic theory. It's fantastic, right? It's so applicable. So let's move on to the reality of the world economy. And, and the reality of the world economy is fascinating today. But let's take three big economic areas. The US. US President Barack Obama gave a State of the Union address. He gives it every year. Um, and this time he was worried about inequality, which has worried him and a lot of Americans for a while. And even though the US has good job figures and it's starting to see growth and uh, it's benefiting from cheap oil, things are a little wobbly. It gets more interesting with Europe. In Europe, the European Central Bank said we are going to have quantitative easing. What does that mean? We are going to print money, in effect. We are going to release a trillion, or more, you know, euros, more than that, over the next few months. And the idea behind that is, okay, there'll be more euros, they'll become cheaper. Once they become cheaper, then European exports get cheaper, then there'll be more jobs. And of course, cheap more euros means interest rate goes down. That means that people will not keep money in the bank, they will spend, you'll have jobs, growth, prosperity, everyone will sing Kumbaya. The reality is it's complicated. There was a huge debate within Europe between France and Germany. The old Catholic Protestant fight is going on, of course. Culturally, Protestant Germany said we have to be frugal, we should have competitive reforms, we need to train people, we need to make uh, structural changes to the economy, which is a big word for saying, all right, to compete, what we'll do is we'll make people work longer, retirement will be later, teach them new skills so that they can work in jobs and, 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 and create a sustainable economy. The French, with their Catholic roots, say, ah, nonsense. We can have more debt. They believe in, uh, in the fact that you can solve the problem later, right now, take more debt, print more money, and, and, and stave off deflation. And this huge cultural clash um, is not just limited to the French and the Germans. There is George Soros who says, hey, hang on a moment. Quantitative easing means you print a lot of money, which means people with money who have assets, like land or shares of Facebook, they get richer, and the others get poorer. And inequality, which Barack Obama is talking about, is going to be a big problem. This is the man, this is the man who broke the Bank of England in 1992, the pound crashed. So what's going on? He is worried about it too. Meanwhile, China, China posts annual growth in 2014 of 7.4%. That is the lowest it has done in over two decades. Doesn't happen all that often, right? That they miss their forecast and their growth drops. And they are worried, and th because th they are worried, uh, how do they find employment for their teaming hundreds of millions? Uh, the Latin Americans are worried because they've been selling cattle, they've been selling iron, they've been selling copper, they've been selling all kinds of commodities to the Chinese. And so the price of commodities drops, so there's a problem in Latin America. And so a very fascinating picture is emerging in the world economy, and it is this. The GDP, which is what everyone changes, chases, is a very crude uh, figure. For instance, in the American context, you give subsidies to corn, that's in GDP. That corn is used to feed cattle, which is totally environmentally unfriendly and ecologically devastating. But that, um, that cattle grows up, a lot of beef, you eat McDonald's. McDonald's, that production of beef and burgers shows up in GDP. Corn is also used to produce sugar. Corn-based sugar, that shows up in GDP. That's also much worse than sugarcane-based sugar. But anyway, that shows up in GDP. So you have America, which is the fattest country on the planet, that, where people go and have burgers and Coke. So you get buy one, get one free, heart attacks and diabetes. Bravo. None of that shows up in GDP. So the environmental damage, the health damage, the whole devastation to the planet is not showing up in the GDP, and yet everyone is onward and forward, and let's chase the GDP figure. And that is the fundamental question and dilemma we have today, that if we chase growth crazily, and if everyone was to live like the Americans, then with over seven billion people on the planet, there won't be a planet left. The planet will be in peril. So this huge, question of, oh, should we go with growth or, uh, and, and higher GDP, or should we think about more sustainable alternative ways? And that requires thinking. The second big question is this fear of deflation versus inequality. 
We are living in, era, in an era of record inequality. Extraordinary inequality. And if this persists, and it is not just income, it is wealth. It is not just wealth, it is education. If this persists, we will have a society once again of lords and serfs, which as we know, tends to lead to instability, especially with an aspirational seven billion people on the planet. And that begs a question. And at the end of it, at the end of all of this, is this underpinning of economics that we are all very rational. Now, not everyone here is, probably has children, but I'm sure everyone, almost everyone here has parents, right? Raise your hands. Those of you who think dealing with your parents and your relationship with your parents has been rational, raise your hands. Yes? And irrational, raise your hands. Ah. So, <laughs> Has anyone been in love here? Has that been rational or irrational? Irrational. irrational. Okay. Now, the fundamental issue at stake is that human beings are complicated creatures. This idea of rationality is very similar to the Judeo-Christian idea of perfection and absolute virtue. In India, in the East, in China, in Vietnam, we don't have this binary distinction. Even the gods are a mix. There is Shiv who's doped out. There is Vishnu who's always sleeping on a thousand-headed snake. There is, there is uh, Krishna who is a playboy and who doesn't have time for, am for amorous activities. There is Ram who is supposedly simple and perfect and he listens to a washerman. Perhaps he's too perfect and too gullible and he kicks his wife out. So the point I'm making is very simply this. Is this idea of economics is dealing with this perfect utility maximizing creature is fiction. It's nonsense. What else explains a Stalin? And so what I leave you with is this. The first joint stock company on the planet was the Dutch East India Company. Capitalism was born red in the tooth and claw and its evil twin was colonization. But we know that communism led to the Red Terror and Stalin and millions of kulaks dead. We know both systems don't work. We know that the existing paradigms of economics are nonsense. It is not a science, it is an art. It is about politics, it is about power, it is about psychology. It is about dealing with moral and ethical questions of our era. It is about dealing with that complex creature called the human being, and it is about questioning. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you adieu.